So within the scope of computer security, we want a way to be able to check that the, say, the human user that's accessing a computer system is who they say they are, and we use that in a number of different uh, other security mechanisms. Authenticating users. Uh, some definition of authentication. The process of verifying a claim that a system entity, the system entity may be a, a person or maybe another computer. The claim that a system entity or system resource, another computer or a program running on another computer, a claim that it has a certain attribute value. So for example, a uh, human claims that they are Steve. The computer needs to verify that. That human made a claim that they have a particular attribute and our computer system needs to go through some procedure to verify that that human is, is in fact Steve and it's not someone pretending to be him. So that's the, the general definition of authentication. We will focus mainly on authenticating human users. But there's a whole other side of how do computers authenticate each other. And we've seen some techniques regarding cryptography, but there are many other techniques as well. There are two steps in authentication. First, we need to identify the user and then verify. So normally with the identification step, that, that user presents some form of ID. Uh, and you know it when you log into systems. That is, you log into Moodle, you log into your favourite website, you usually need to present a, a user ID or a user name. Okay. So that identifies you. It's generally unique, so within the context of that system, that user ID is usually uh, different from everyone else's. But it's not necessarily secret. So, I think most people know everyone else's user ID for their Moodle account. It's you followed by your student ID, and the student IDs of other students are probably unfortunately easy to find. So that's not secret. Same as your email account. What is your user ID? If you've got Hotmail, Gmail, or some other email account, what's your user ID? Your, your email username. Okay, so that is of course not secret because that email address you need to distribute to others. You can't keep that secret. So the ID is usually not secret. And in many cases we assume it will be public. So we try to identify ourselves to the system saying who we claim to be and then the system needs to go through some verification. And that involves the user presenting some information, usually, or generating information that acts as evidence to prove that this user is who they say they are, that they have that attribute that they're claiming. For example, I claim to be Steve. I need to present some evidence to prove that I am. That's the verification step. And some common ways we know is a password. So when I log into my Gmail account, my ID is my email address, but to prove that I'm the user that owns that email address, I must also submit some other evidence, and that's usually a password. With the idea that only one person should know that password. And knowing that password is evidence that you're the person that owned the, the account. And there are other techniques, pins, so numbers, but we can call as a, a really a subset of passwords, and also biometric information, maybe your fingerprint, for example. Often this verification step uses evidence which is secret. We usually assume passwords or pins should be kept secret, or cannot be generated by others. So if we think about biometric information, say your fingerprint. Is your fingerprint secret? Not really. I mean, you don't go around walking holding your finger so no one can see it. You, it's public. But it's hard to be generated by others. Okay. 
So one or the other. It doesn't necessarily have to be secret. There was uh, a, a report maybe last month that someone could take a photo from within a few meters with a good camera of someone's finger and take a photo and then use that to fake their fingerprint. Okay? So there are problems with biometric information. So biometric information usually is not secret, but it's hard to be recreated by someone else. You must be in possession of it to be able to use it. We'll see some ex more examples of biometric information. User authentication is a very important part of defending computer systems. Many other security controls depend upon it. For example, access control. Who can do particular things on a computer? Who can read this file? Who can write to this file? That's access control. But that all depends upon authenticating the user in the first step. Same as who can take the quiz for, for Moodle, for your uh, quiz 2. Well, that depends upon that the authentication of the user has worked correctly. So it's very important for even other parts of the computer system security. How do you authenticate? There are roughly four different ways people talk about. When we're authentic authenticating people, so we're going to focus on authenticating people, humans. Something that the person knows can act as evidence. So something that I know that no one else could know can be evidence that I'm that person. Passwords, pins, answers to questions. So my password, in theory, I, only I know the password. Therefore, if I can supply that to the computer system, then if it matches a previously supplied password that that computer system stores, then that computer system can prove or takes that as proof that the person trying to access that system is who they say they are. So that's based on something that the user, the human user, knows. We'll focus mainly upon that, but we'll see a few examples of others as well. Something they possess, something they have with them, and we call them generally tokens. So a key, a physical key, can act as a token, whether it's a, a key, a key card, a swipe card, uh, there's smart cards, which are really uh, key cards with, with some embedded processor and memory in them. Physical keys, they act as tokens. Sometimes USB uh, drives can be configured to, if you have possession of it, you can use that as evidence that you're the person who's supposed to be accessing this computer system. Similar with mobile phones now. With mobile phones, and a second form of authentication is that uh, sometimes a bank or a, a company will send you an SMS or a message to your mobile phone and the fact that you possess that phone and can respond or use the information in the message acts as some proof that you're the person who's allowed to access the system. So some systems may use a combination of what you know, a password, plus what you possess, say a phone. If you know the password and you possess the phone that is attached to that account, because you've registered your phone number there, then you can access and log in. Or some smart cards or, or bank cards may require a combination of PIN and presence of the actual card. If you don't have the card, you cannot access your account. If you don't have the PIN, you cannot access your account. You need both. The other thing is, and the last two are, are related, so how do we authenticate someone? Well, based on what someone knows, what they have, what they possess, what they are is, is what they are, that individual is. So here we talk about static biometrics, so something about the person that doesn't change. That's the static part of it. So your fingerprint doesn't change, generally. That's considered a, a, a biometric authentication technique, and it's static. Your eye or your retina 
your face, the, the characteristics of that generally are unique amongst a set of people, a set of uh, users. So therefore, you can use them as a way to prove that you are that particular user. So with a fingerprint, first you register your fingerprint with the computer system. And then when you want to access that computer system, you supply your fingerprint and that compares your supplied fingerprint with the registered one. If they match, the computer system assumes it's, it's the right person, it's you. And this depends upon the fact that, okay, again, you must have that, but it's something about what you are, You're part of your body, really. And these things don't change, or, or very seldomly change. The other biometric is about some things that do change, so what, you, uh, what an individual does or what you do. Dynamic biometrics. So other things like your voice pattern, your handwriting, maybe your, the way that you type keys can be used, keys on, keys on your keyboard can be used to identify uh, some users. So you talk into a, a microphone attached to some computer system and that compares your supplied voice with some voice uh, recording on, uh, that the computer system has. If they have the same characteristics, we can say it's the same person. That's the idea. Same with handwriting. So different, four different ways to authenticate humans. Which one do you use most? Which, right, we all use passwords a lot, I think. So we'll spend a lot of time talking about passwords. So do you use any others? Which, which examples? Smart card. Smart card. What for? <laughs> right, for entry into, into buildings, for example. The possession of that card acts as proof that you are a person who's allowed to enter. Okay, if you don't have the card, you cannot enter. Of course, you can think of some obvious flaws with that. You can pass the card to someone else. Okay, so there's some limitations. This one, anyone? Right, some, some buildings have it. In SIT we have, I have to do it every day <laughs> when I come to work. Uh, not so much for security, more for monitoring. But uh, some of the, the rooms, the labs here have the fingerprint. On our network lab we have a fingerprint to open the door there. And this one you don't see as common, okay? Why? It's hard. It's hard to, to implement. You need, say, to record the voice of someone. Let's say we have on this door to get into the lecture room. We want to restrict who can come into the building. Then with a key card it's quite easy, quite cheap to implement supplying key cards to people and having a machine to read them. But with, say, voice pattern recognition, first everyone needs to register their voice, and then when they try to get into the building, they must say something. And getting that to work well is quite difficult because you must make sure that there is no, uh, no noise from other sources so that the voice recording is good. Uh, and comparing voice patterns is computationally difficult. So only in cases where high security may be needed, uh, these may be applied, or in combination with others. We will focus mainly on what you know and, and generally about passwords. Say a little bit about the others towards the end. This is a quote from a, a textbook about network security. And it's about humans and computers. So normally we focus on the computer side, how to implement the software, the hardware and so on. But when we deal with humans, as a designer, we consider humans are large, expensive to maintain with, compared to computers, hard to manage humans, and of course they create a lot of pollution. It's astonishing that these devices, us humans, continue to be made and deployed. But unfortunately, there are so many of us around that we must design our 
communication protocols, our security protocols around the limitations of humans. So if we didn't have to deal with humans in dividing, designing computer security, life would be much easier. Can humans encrypt using AES? If I give you, can you encrypt something you, using AES in your head? No. no. Computers can quite easily. Okay. Uh, can you remember a 64-bit key? No. 64-bit random binary value? No. Humans are not so good for that. A computer can. It stores it in memory. So there are some limitations of us which make it difficult to design computer security uh, for, for different systems. So, of course, we cannot avoid us. We must design around humans, and often they are the weakest link in our system security. And one of those weak links is passwords and using passwords to authenticate users. It's very pervasive. It's everywhere, but it's a big problem in terms of security. So passwords include, we may, other things we don't think of passwords, so pins is also a form of a password, whether it's a number or a, letter, a set of letters similar. What's your password for Moodle? <laughs> the, right, the, the first rule of passwords is don't tell anyone about your passwords. Okay? So, a, a general principle, don't tell anyone what your password is. Of course, things are not so easy. One of the common This is a, a, a small cartoon. So in terms of computer security and cryptography, many people think that, OK, I have my laptop. I want to protect it. And people, an attacker is trying to break into it. So they've got my laptop. And they, they find it's encrypted. So they go and have an idea, let's build a computer that will crack the encryption. But we think that, OK, let's just use a key which is long enough. We know that brute force attack is not possible if we have a large enough key. So we should use a long key to stop someone from building an expensive computer to break, break it. So we stop people accessing our, our computer by using cryptographic techniques. Unfortunately, there are alternatives. The alternative, maybe in some cases, is to exploit the human weakness. And that is, instead of having to break the encryption of the laptop, just go to the person who owns it and hit them on the head until they tell you the, the password. Okay, so we need to uh, realize that sometimes there are weaknesses that we don't often think about when we're dealing with cryptography. In this course, we will not use this technique for breaking uh, into systems, but it is a real issue. There are many different ways to defeat the security of a system, not just technical. So with passwords, that arises a lot as well. There are different ways to defeat uh, the security of password-based authentication. Some of them are technical, some are based upon human behavior and, and, and social engineering. So let's look at how password authentication works. So many computer systems use password-based authentication. So we talk about multi-user computer systems. It could be my laptop, which has accounts for multiple users who want to use that laptop. We need a way to authenticate the, the user and make sure that I can access it and you can't access my laptop and get my exam questions. Uh, it couldn't be, can be a shared computer, um, but more commonly nowadays it's some website or some computer system on the internet where 
many users have access and we use a combination of an ID and a password to authenticate the users. How does that work? The, so we talk about the computer system that we're trying to access and the user that's trying to access it. The system initially stores a username and password for the corresponding users. So there's some initial registration and I think you know that when you create an email account then the first thing you do is you choose the email address that's your ID and your maybe supply some other information about yourself but you must supply a password so this registration step must be done where you store your username and password on the computer system that you're going to access later and then later when you want to access it the way that it works is that you submit your username and password to the system and the system compares your submitted value and your stored value if they match it assumes you're the correct user if they don't match it assumes you're not the correct user so that's the user authentication using usernames and, and passwords or identities and passwords so first a little bit about the ID what's a good ID to use for user authentication it depends a lot about the system It's a mistake it de determines whether user is authorized to gain access to the system so that's what the ID is for so if you don't supply an ID that's been registered then you will not get access to the system that's the first check the ID sometimes determines privileges of users okay so I can log in to uh, the Moodle website as Steve and I get the privileges of an instructor or a lecturer but alternatively I could log in the same human user as a different using a different ID like admin and then I'd have the privileges to to create courses and to do many different things that the lecturer couldn't do so the same human may log in using different IDs and the ID can be used to determine what that user is allowed to do the privileges of those users and a specific case of that is it's used in access control that is users with particular IDs will be granted permissions to do things on that computer system and if you've been in our network lab we've seen examples of access control of on files we have read write execute permissions some users can read files other users cannot read those same files how do we determine that it's based upon the identity of that user the username for example we will not say much more about what the ID is usually there the structure of an ID depends upon the computer system we want to focus on the password part of it that's the security part so when you choose a password and submit a password there are a number of issues with respect to security what is a good password <laughs> I think we can all think of what is a bad password we can think of examples of ba bad passwords one two three four your name password the word password your birthday what's a good password so upper mix of uppercase lowercase numbers other characters not a word long okay many characters not just two characters three characters we'll look at that later of some guidelines and some uh, many examples of what's bad of a password to try and arrive at well what what are some rules or some pre procedures we can use to choose a good password the other thing that we need to address is when you register your username and password that password is stored on the computer system we need to keep that password secure again the, the password must be kept secret it's stored somewhere on the computer system that we're accessing so how do we store that is an important thing 
and we'll spend some time on that. So when you implement that computer system and you implement an authentication technique, you need to make sure that the way that you store the password is a good way. How do you submit passwords? So you have a computer system on, that you want to access. You're on the other side of the world using your web browser trying to log in. So how that works is that you send your username and password from your web browser to the computer system across the internet. How to do that such that no one in the middle can intercept and find your password. So the submission is another issue. And things like what to do if, if the password submitted is incorrect. How to respond. So we'll see examples or, or some issues with all of them in this topic. Before we go through them, we'll just draw a quick picture of what the model is, uh, how we can think of it. We have a user. Here's our user. And we, we can think that they have a computer that they're using, a nice picture of a computer. And here's the computer system that they want to access. That is, this user wants to access this computer system. Usually they'll do it via another computer, especially in web-based systems across the internet. So, <laughs> I've got an old PC, that's why it's, this one's so big. Uh, so, there's, I will not draw it, but there's a process of registration where this system has some, some database. I think there's some database. Inside there is a list of IDs and password. So this database for all the users that are going to access this system stores something about the, the ID of those users and the password of those users. So that's the stored values. And then when our user wants to access that system, they submit or supply a, a value. So you can think that they supply a ID and password. And then there should be a response. That's the general model of what we'll consider with passwords. Not drawn here, but initially the user registers with the system, and in that registration process they select an ID and password, and then that's stored on the system that we're trying to access later, Think of it in a database, it doesn't have to be, it can be a file, it can be a memory. And then when that user later wants to access that computer system, we say they submit their ID and password, and the system compares the submitted values with the stored values. If they match, then the response will be positive, saying yes, you can access. If they don't match, then the response will be negative, saying something's wrong. So that's our model we need to look at how to store the passwords, because note that the password is secret information. If someone can access this computer system and then get all the usernames and passwords, then that can be a sec security compromise. How to choose passwords when you register, that's another issue. What's a good password? How should you submit your password across an, a network, especially across the internet? Here we have an internet and someone may intercept that message if we're sending it across the network and, and discover your password. And how should the system respond? What type of message should it send, especially if you get the password wrong? So, back to our lecture notes. There are many problems with passwords. We will list a few here, or most of them, and classify them. 
and then we'll go into some details about a selection of them. So vulnerabilities of passwords. What, what can go wrong such that the security is compromised? First, what's called an offline dictionary attack. Somehow, the attacker obtains access to the database. That is, somehow, the attacker finds this database, which is a database listing everyone's ID and password. So if the attacker can find that, then they learn the secret information. So the, the security has been compromised. So we need some way to store, store that such that even if they get access to the database, they cannot get access to their password value. And we'll go through the, the different options and we'll arrive at the, we make use of hash functions to instead of storing the password, store a hash of the password. So an offline dictionary attack would be the attacker obtains that database and then tries to find the corresponding passwords which are stored in there. And one way is to, uh, the, the concept of offline means that we don't do that attack on the computer system. We get the database, copy it to our own computer as the attacker, and do the attack using our own resources. We're not limited by the, the computer system. A dictionary attack means simply if we're trying to find or guess passwords, try common words or uh, try values which are related to words in a dictionary. Not random characters, but words which are structured or, or strings which are structured based upon words in the dictionary. We'll spend some more time on that one as we uh, pass through these different vulnerabilities. What we need to do is control, control who can access that database. On that computer system, the database should be somehow protected, this database. No one should be able to just connect to this computer system and just download the entire database. So we need some special protections on that database. In addition, even if someone can get access to the, the to the database, we need to use techniques to either encrypt the passwords. So if they get the database, they must find the key to decrypt. But often that's not practical, so we, instead of using encryptions, we use hash functions to store the password. So we'll explain, explain how to use them. But there are other types of attacks. Even if they can't get the database, what can an attacker do? A specific account attack. An attacker wants to uh, get into my account on Moodle. Okay? They want to get in my account. What they can do is submit my username, my ID, which uh, let's assume that they know, and just try some password, maybe a random password. So it's on a specific account, on one person's account. The attacker submits a, an ID, a known ID, and guesses a password. If the system responds failed, then the attacker tries another password. Fail, try again, and just keep going. So try different passwords for a specific account. How do we stop that? And I think you've seen it in use, in practice. Set a limit. Set a, a limit of how many attempts can be made. So if there are, say, five failed attempts on that specific account, do not allow any further attempts. And you see that using probably, I hope you haven't seen it, but you've heard it using your bank and an ATM. If you supply your, your PIN three times wrong, then it eats your card. Okay? The machine takes your card and you can't make a fourth attempt. Okay? So that's an example of stopping someone from even if they have your card, from just trying many different pins. If you only have a four-digit pin, then there's only 10,000 combinations to try. Okay. So there's a way to, as a countermeasure in that case. Lock the account after too many failed attempts. What's the problem with this countermeasure? OK, 
Okay, so that works, but what's the problem with it? So let's say, uh, all right, for Moodle, you all have accounts on Moodle, and I want to make the system secure, so I implement a countermeasure. If someone tries to log into an account and they make one failed attempt, I will lock that account. What can go wrong? Right, it could have been the real user and they just typed their password wrong, they made a mistake. If we lock the account, then they may make a mistake and then they're locked out. And it's inconvenient for them because now they need to take some other steps to try and get their account unlocked. The same with a bank, if you, if you lose your, your ATM card because you tried the pin three times, then you need to the next day go to the bank and get get a new card or something. So it's inconvenient if, if it's the real user that gets locked out. And similar, we can, an attacker can take advantage of this countermeasure and do a denial of service attack. So what I can do if I want to uh, stop you from accessing your account, then all I do is submit say three wrong passwords into your account and now you're locked out of your account. So I deny you from accessing the normal service. So we need to make a trade-off between these countermeasures which improve security and the consequences of them which usually make things more inconvenient or perform worse. Related, but slightly different, a popular password attack. Let's say I know many uh, different IDs for a particular computer system. Instead of attacking a specific account, attack any account and trying a popular password for many different IDs. An example, I know the user IDs for all the students who have a Moodle account. I know the, the list of ID numbers. So I know all the IDs. What I do is for the first ID, I try the password 1234. It didn't work. So I move on to the next user ID and try 1234. And I'm, unfortunately, I, I'm quite confident that after I try all the students here that have a Moodle account, I probably get one that gets access. So this is trying a popular password something that many people may use on many different accounts with the aim of just getting access to one of them from the attacker's perspective. So we can't lock the account after too many attempts because we only make one attempt per account. So somehow we need to make sure the user doesn't choose that popular password. When you register your password, have some rules that say you cannot choose the password 1234. Okay. So control how users select their passwords. Or maybe block computers that make multiple attempts. We identify the IP address who's making many attempts at many different accounts and then block that computer. What can go wrong? What are the, the negatives of using these countermeasures? The user's not going to try, a, a normal user's not going to try to log in with different IDs. That's unlikely. Okay. What's the problem with controlling password selection? That is, for example, I set a rule. When you create a new password on Moodle, I set a rule. The password cannot be a popular password. So I set up some rules and I say, it cannot be a word that's in a dictionary. I, that's the rule. Uh, popular means, all right, um, maybe we'll see later that one that's too short. So it needs to be 15 characters long. It needs to be random. So that's the rule for creating your password. What's the problem with that? Yeah. 
you, you will not be happy with that password that is 15 random characters. You'll forget it. You'll write it down. And then it's easier for someone else to learn it. So it, it lets in other weaknesses if we have a password that users do not find convenient. Okay, so we need to make a trade-off. We need to control what passwords the user can select but don't make it too hard for the user to select a password they can remember. Blocking computers that make multiple attempts. It may be that via the, the networking techniques of firewalls and network address translation that blocking a computer from making attempts may block the normal users from accessing the system. So you need to be careful when you block things that you don't just block the attackers, but you're, uh, you shouldn't block the normal users. Let's keep going. Password guessing against a single user. You want to get access to my account for Moodle so you can change your scores for the quiz. So you try to guess my password. You don't try many random passwords. That was the specific account. You try and guess it within three attempts. You know the system will lock you out after three attempts. So in this attack, you try and guess the password based upon knowledge of that person. Okay. So if you know something about the person who has that account, maybe you can guess the password easier. Again, we, to stop that, control how users select passwords so they're hard to guess. They're long and they don't follow some common structure. So it involves not just controlling the user via some technical controls, but also training the user. Inform users that the way they select passwords should, uh, should follow certain guidelines and inform them of the consequences of selecting a bad password. Another one, computer hijacking. I've logged into my computer, I go out for a break for five minutes, someone walks up to my laptop and now they have hijacked my computer. They logged in as me because it didn't log out when I left. How do we stop that? Some form of auto logout. After two minutes of inactivity on my laptop, it automatically logs me out. So when I go away, someone can't log in. Again, I think you can see the trade-offs with inconvenience. Let's say your computer automatically logs you out every one minute. Then you just have a break because you don't do something for one minute and now you need to log back in again. So there's a trade-off there. Exploiting user mistakes. A user writes down their password because it was too, too long or too, too random for them to remember. A user shares their password with friends. Or somehow they're tricked into telling someone their password. Then we need, again, some training of users not to do these things. Explain them uh, how those things can arise and what the consequences are. And maybe use passwords with some other form of authentication. Like not just a password, but also have to supply some number which is sent to you via SMS or a, a message on your phone a one-time password you, you see with different uh, online systems today. So even if someone gets your password, they also need that other thing, your mobile phone, to get access. Again, inconvenient. If you don't have your phone with you at that point in time, then you cannot access. We access many different computer systems, many different websites we may have accounts for. One thing an attacker can do is exploit the, the fact that many people use the same password in different computer systems. So if I'm an attacker that can learn your password for Moodle, then I may, of course, get access to your Moodle account, but then I may try that same password for your bank, bank account. So 
if people reuse passwords of diff across different systems, then the attackers can take advantage of that. How do you stop that? The, the, the suggestion, the countermeasure there is not really practical. How do I stop someone from not using the same password in Moodle as they use in their bank account? I cannot really stop it. Maybe if I control both websites, you could coordinate and check that, say, within an organization, the, your account on Moodle, on registration and so on, they don't use the same password. But generally, uh, over, uh, outside of the system in, in our control, we cannot control what password a particular user's, user uses on different systems. So that's a hard one. Can anyone access your password for Moodle? Of course, the person who, who administrates the computer system can. Remember our picture. Your password, when you registered, is stored on this computer, the server. There's some person who has access to that server, who could, in theory, get access to the passwords. Who is that person? It's me. So in theory, I can access all of your passwords. And in any computer system where you've registered a password, assume the administrator of that computer system can learn their password. They shouldn't, and they should, but in, there's no really technical ways to make it hard for someone to do that. So again, reusing across different accounts is a problem. Not just if someone gets it from hacking into this system, but the administrator knows the password that you use on this system, therefore you shouldn't use it on another system. When you submit your password, it's usually sent across a network, so if someone can intercept, at this point, then if you don't use the right techniques, then someone can learn the password as it's been submitted. How do we stop that? How do we stop someone from overhearing this password sent across the internet between you, your web browser, and some website? What mechanism do we use? Encrypt the password. Okay, so we, we've learned the concepts of encryption. If we want to send a message across a public network like the internet and we don't want others to see that message, we should encrypt that message. What key do we use to encrypt? That's another problem we have. Okay, How do we choose a key that both sides know? We'll see that maybe in a later topic when we look at web security, some approaches for that. Many vulnerabilities of passwords, but we still use them. Okay, so there are many weaknesses, and many computer systems are compromised due to these weaknesses, but the trade-off has made that they're currently the most convenient for people to use. So we need, still need to improve how they're used. Any questions about the vulnerabilities? the difference between those six or seven vulnerabilities. Remember them. Good idea. Or at, at least recognize if I, if I say what's the difference between the specific account attack and a popular password attack. Think about that. We'll spend some time, we'll start it today, and uh, start tomorrow. <laughs> we're, we've got to spend some time on how do we store passwords. Okay. That is, uh, that database on the computer system, when you register the password, how, how should that be stored? Because one job that you may have in the future is creating 
websites creating applications that store passwords. So there's some, some ways to do that and some weaknesses. But maybe we'll do that tomorrow because it takes some time. What we'll do is go to this one, selecting <laughs> passwords. Okay. Much easier. How should we select passwords? Some suggestions. You want to create a rule that you can give to some other users, your parents, your friends, the users of your website. You want to create a rule to suggest to them how they should choose a good password. What would you tell them? Or if you don't know, think of how do you choose a good password? How do you do it? Right, so make sure your password is a mixture of uppercase letters, lowercase letters and numbers. All right, so some mixture of different characters. Anything else? So, yeah. A long password, so you should give a suggestion about how long the password should be. More than, more than 12 <laughs> characters. Good suggestion. I will not ask you what your password is, but just think about maybe two or three of your passwords you use the most. Okay? Think about them and think about their length. How many people have one of those passwords which is less than four characters? All right, not many systems today will allow less than four. Some do. Less than eight? Eight or less? On some systems I have a password eight or less. Less than ten, so ten, nine. More than ten? Who has a password more than ten characters? More than twelve? More than sixteen? Good. <laughs> right, not many people will be have passwords more than say 10 or 12 characters. We'll give some statistics shortly, but that's a, a big issue, the length. Why don't you have a password more than 12 characters? You cannot remember it? Why not choose the... Uh, right, you, you can remember some passwords more than 12 characters. Okay, but yes, if it's a... a say random or semi-random mixture of characters, it's hard to remember. What else is wrong with a long password? Harder to remember and... Again? Storage on the computer system, in theory yes, but in practice not a big problem. What's the problem for you using a long password? Typing is hard. Okay. All right. There's not much difference to type in a password of 6 versus 8, but 6 versus 12, well, it takes a bit more time, especially on a mobile device if you're using your phone to enter that password. 12 characters versus 6 characters, the convenience of doing a long password is an issue. Any other suggestions? Long password. What's your suggestion for the long password? What length? What's the minimum length? Six or more, okay. Eight or more, maybe. All right. We've got mixture of uppercase, lowercase, and digits, numbers. Long, I say eight or more. Any other suggestions? Some people said them before. Don't use your name. Don't use your birth date. Don't use things which are about you. Don't use your username, an obvious one. Don't use words from dictionaries. Okay. So some rules. Let's have a look. There are a few slides here which just show uh, some people have done analysis of some leaked passwords. That is, a list of passwords of many users has been leaked on the internet. So someone has obtained that and done some, looked at the statistics of those passwords. Troy Hunt has a website which I've grabbed these figures from. 
from different leaked passwords, in this case from 300,000 passwords of different users, someone of that database has released it on the internet and some statistics, in this case analyzing the passwords, see that the green one, 25% of those passwords, one quarter, are dictionary words. So this is some indicator of how people do choose passwords. 25% we consider are bad because they are from a dictionary. How many words in a dictionary? About? About how many words in a dictionary? In the order of hundreds of thousands. Okay, so in an English dictionary there may be a hundred thousand, but if we have stemming and so on, maybe up to a million. But not so many, so uh, in terms of just words, there's usually in a language hundreds of thousands of words. So many people choose words from a dictionary. That's bad because what the first thing that the attacker tries when they try and guess your password is one of those 100,000 words. And we'll see the ways that that is quite easy to try with modern day computers. What else do we see? The blue one up the top is a person name. So 14% of people chose a password which is a name of someone. Not necessarily their name, but a name of someone. Again, what an attacker does, if they're trying to guess a password, if a word from a dictionary doesn't work, try a word which is someone's name. So get a name list and you can download name lists to, to try them. 8% a place name, like a city or a country. 14% uh, were numbers. So no, no uh, uppercase or lowercase letters, just digits. And then a mix of others like uh, some short phrase, so not just a single word but a combination of words. Some keyboard pattern, Q-W-E-R-T-Y. Okay, the, the, uh, the first five letters at the top of the, the keyboard or other more complex patterns. And again, assume the attacker knows this, so the first things an attacker is going to do if they're trying to guess a password is try the common ones. And if they're try just trying to find some accounts, then it's a good chance that they can guess a password. Some other, some other details. What about changing the language? Does it help? Not much. If it's a computer trying to guess the password, using a different language doesn't help much. Because the same statistics would apply usually in, in that language. So uh, if it's a human trying to guess your password, maybe the language helps because the human cannot make so, so many guesses. But a computer can try many guesses within a short amount of time. So a different language doesn't change things much. This is from some other analysis of a different database of passwords which were leaked and analysis of the length. And this showed that most people chose between six and eight character long passwords. Few people will use less than six and in fact most computer systems today will limit. You must have a password longer some value. Few people use more than ten. Okay, I think here in the class, the statistics of this class, because you're very security conscious, you have long passwords. But in the general population, I think most people will not use more than 10. Okay. Have you got a password more than 12 characters? No, most people would not. But I see someone here was counting on her fingers, so I think you do good. So just. This is indicating that despite the rules that we may create, humans are going to follow this pattern and try and choose passwords in the order of six to eight characters. Some other studies have been done on some common characteristics of passwords. Most use alphanumeric characters, that is letters and numbers. Alphabet and numbers. Most passwords are in dictionaries. 
not just your standard dictionary, but password dictionaries. Lists of strings that people have created which are common for passwords. Many users reuse passwords across systems. Hands up if you reuse a password across different websites. Everyone does. Because nowadays, you need passwords for so many different systems, you can't just create a new one or remember uh, each one for each different website. So that's a big problem. There are some very common passwords. So in all leaks of passwords that come up, there's usually some at the top. Okay. Another study has, has realized that when you force someone to change their passwords every month or every few months, they must change their password. Most users will try and change just a single character. My password is Steve. I have to change it for every month, so the next month I change it to Steve 2, and the next month Steve 3, and just keep changing it. So forcing people to change their passwords doesn't always have the intended effect. So we will not study too much more about what are the best rules for choosing a password, but I think you should give us some thought about how you choose passwords and whether it's a good approach and whether uh, you can think up maybe a better approach for suggesting to others of choosing passwords. And some strategies include uh, to make password selection better, inform people of what, why it's important to choose a good password, what can go wrong if you don't choose a good password, advise them on what strategies they can use, maybe think of a, a, a song name, think of your favorite song and choose the first letters of each word in that song name. <coughs> Okay, so easy to remember the song name and just think of the first letters in each word in that song name. It doesn't have to be long. The resulting password may not be long. Okay, and it mixes up the characters. So just an example of a strategy. Computer generated passwords. Instead of getting the user to select the password, create one for them. doesn't work very well. Can I find an example? You can find software that will generate passwords for you. Zoom out a bit. For example, this is some simple software that generates passwords. Let's say when you create an account, you must use this password. Again, what's the problem with computer generated passwords? Inconvenient. Okay. Hard to remember? Here's your password. AUF7EY3Z. Inconvenient? And that is hard, hard to remember? and sometimes hard to type in. So it makes it uh, unlikely to get it correct all the time. You can have variations where you generate pronounceable random passwords. So this is roughly random type passwords, but we could generate passwords which were pronounceable but semi-random. To make something pronounceable, you need the right combination of uh, consonants and vowels. Okay, so you need an E, A, E, I, O, or U in the right position, and it can be a nonsensical word, but still pronounceable. And people generally find it easy to remember pronounceable things. So computer-generated passwords don't seem to work very well because users don't like them. Reactive password checking. When 
the system automatically checks user passwords and lets them know if they have a bad password. And proactive is when they are selecting the password, the system advises them on the strength. And I think nowadays you see this in many websites. When you register a password, the website will give some visual feedback. Strong, uh, fair, weak, and maybe show a colour to indicate is the password you're choosing a good one or not. So that seems to help people in selecting better passwords. What we'll do tomorrow is look at how to store passwords and then look at some of the attacks that can happen on someone who tries to get access to the password database.